Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Invesco QQQ. What do all the greatest innovators have in common, Michael? Blockchain? You don't want... <laughs> Agents, people who help shape the future by supporting cutting edge ideas. Invesco QQQ, also known as Q's, is a fund that allows you access to innovators of the NASDAQ 100, all in one fund. So you don't have to be an inventor to help create what's coming next. Anyone can become an agent of innovation with Invesco QQQ. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Before we get into it, Michael, we have to do some promotion. Next week, March 23rd, 1 I p.m. Central Time. Let's do, quick, do your app to change that into Eastern Time. Carry the one. 2.30 Eastern Time, March 23rd, we are doing a webinar with Y Charts. Right? It's going to be live. What are we going to talk about? Everything. What There's a lot we, to talk what are, about. What are, we, what are we not going to talk about? Okay. So we're going to have a link in our show notes to register for this webinar. It's going to be great. It's going to be us. It's going to be Y Charts. It should be fun. Uh, last week at the Y Charts offices, we recorded our show Tuesday morning. One of the things we talked about. I have been saying for a while, the Fed is going to break something. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I've just been saying it. I've been wrong. And last week we said, why hasn't the Fed broken anything yet? It's, it's surprising. In a year, rates went from basically 0% to 5%. It, it doesn't seem logical that nothing's broken yet. And we stipulated that the housing market was frozen, that there's obviously a tech recession, but like truly something, an event, right? An event. Yes. And we got it 48 hours later. And I... I would have never guessed, oh, it's going to be the financial system. It's going to be a run of the banks. <laughs> There's no way that that would have ever come into my, crossed my mind that this is going to be it. Well, and to that to that point, before we before we dive deep into the S's, the Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Silvergate, I, I, want to, I want to maybe give a pat on the back to a lot of people who over the years um, had come off as maybe extreme in their views that low interest rates were truly distorting markets. And I think, you know, I think I was probably mostly on the other side of that. Um, maybe I didn't see the, the harm uh, or didn't take it seriously enough. So one of the un, one of the unintended consequences that I didn't see coming is that the event was going to happen as a result of a bank potentially, mis, not potentially, mismanaging their deposits. Because that is the result of the Fed going from zero to 450. Right? Like that just was not on my bingo card. That caused the implosion. So I think people that have been warning about it uh, deserve some recognition. I, I, I think, think? the, one, I think the biggest, I think that's fair. I think the biggest problem is it's obvious now in retrospect the Fed waited way too long to raise, but I think it was well, obvious. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Not in retrospect, in real time. Yeah, in, people, in March yes. of 2022, okay, we were like, time. in February 2022, we said, what is go why are they still buying mortgage bonds or wherever it was? Inflation was already over six uh, six percent at that point, or seven yeah. percent. So in real time, people were saying, "What are they doing?" So that's but not the, revisionist history. The problem is, yes, there was a lot of people screaming that, and they were saying it before the pandemic too. But the problem is, they compounded that mistake by raising too fast, coming off of it. So yes. it was a double edged. They they gave themselves a double whammy of waiting too long and then raising too aggressively. And that's always been my thing: is that oh, let me throw they, this chart in here. So if, if you look at the, the interest rate rises in the from 1950 to 1980, we went from 2% to 15% on the 10-year. Look, look, look at this chart that I just threw in here. Okay, so, you, so the thing is you have this the, – the 1981 is, the, is the, the fastest one, right? I mean mm -mm. in the early 80s. So this is, this is before. No, but, no, 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 no. No, listen to me. The one from 77 to 1980 was the steepest. But the right. one that we okay. just lived through, 2022, they have never – raised rates as fast as they did to this level. Right. And the, the thing is that back then, rates had been rising for throughout the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And it happened very slowly. So you, treasuries didn't get crushed back then because rates ris had rose so slowly. So the rates that you were earning had a chance to catch up. That's why, we, that's why last year was the biggest losses ever in bonds. So you didn't have the catch-up period. It happened so fast. Everything got annihilated. And yeah, the the... I guess I'm surprised it, it took this long. And again, I didn't think this is what, what it was going to be. To be no, fair, no, because Ben, ben because we, what we thought was there's people are people are uh, speculating. There's risk. There's a bubble in venture. There's a bubble in uh, all of that sort of stuff. That's where our focus was. It was on the valuation and the the the, the crash in asset prices. 
we weren't on my bigger card was not uh, uh, asset liability mismatch or and mismanaging of deposits at a bank that would cause this. I didn't think that would happen. No. And now there's never there's there's a this is there's a, there's a clear line of demarcation. There is a before SVB and after. Banking yes. will never be the same. How come it's always a bingo card, by the way? Why does it always have to be a bingo card that that is a forecast? It's just what it is. I don't make the rules. Okay. The. It, it is true that this was this felt out of left field. There's people now saying that, like, you know, a lot of people were saying that they are technically insolvent, but that's kind of the way that things work if you held to maturity. So obviously, the Fed is not the only cause of the problem here. This. But bank, wait, hang on, hang on. I, I, I think I don't think the bank was insolvent. On a mark to market basis, we can get into some of this kind of stuff, like the reason. That, so obviously, the Fed is not the sole problem here. There was plenty of other banks that managed their interest rate risk just fine in their loan book. In Silicon Valley Bank didn't, so you you can't say the whole problem is the Fed. They're obviously we're we're going to get into it here. Yeah, but I don't think if Jamie if Jamie Dimon was running the bank, that probably would have would not have happened. But absent a bank run, now you could say that there was a bank run because they mismanaged it. Fine, but if 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 everybody didn't leave, we would not be having this conversation. No, and it is true. I just did a blog post where I went through a bunch of different questions and I said, what are the unintended consequences of this? And sometimes you see those unintended consequences right away and you see like other dominoes fall immediately. And sometimes it, this could be like five to seven years in the future. Something else happens and we look back and we go, you know why this happened? Because of the rule changes that happened from Silicon Valley Bank. On the other hand, this could be a one-off thing where like the Fed stepped in and they changed some rules and they trust is back in the system. And we look back in six months and go, Mo, that was crazy. So I, I really don't know what the next steps are here. So let's, let's zoom out, take a step back, as they say, for people that have not been keeping up with the story that are tuning in to really hear what happened. So the story this, this is, is a crossover story. I've been getting, like, we always talk about civilians, people outside of the finance world asking us questions. I've been getting tons of questions from people being like, whoa, 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 what people don't never thought they had to worry about their bank before. And now they before, think they have to worry about it. Yeah, before we get into this, listen, I, I I love, love, love what I do. I feel like the luckiest person in the world that we get to help people um, with their money and educate people. Like, it is truly a blessing. Uh, but I also do wonder about the other side of it. Like, my wife, for example, had zero stress over the weekend. Her stress was about, was about Kobe's birthday party. Zero right. worries. Whereas yeah. I am, I am, <laughs> I was at my, I was basically at my screen the entire weekend. And she's like, you're not the f***ing president. Like, what do you think you're going to do about it? <laughs> you know, and I was, I, I was feeling uh, a lot of, a lot of anxiety um, about the situation. Because I think, I think at the, at the, on the one hand, maybe some people were overblowing the severity, but on the other hand, it was really serious. Like this there was not, this was not a joke. I was, I was paralyzed a little bit. You and, did, you did and, say a few times on Slack that you were, you're, you kept saying, I'm shook. You, you said that. The funny I, thing I, is I had the same well, thing happen to if, me. If the Fed and FDIC and the Treasury did not do what they did, if they didn't act on Sunday night, they would have acted by Tuesday morning or Monday night because it would have been chaos. Yeah. So and not I'm, just in the stock market, not just in the stock market on Main Street. Go ahead, Ben. The funny thing is I had a similar thought with my wife this weekend where she like, she never thinks about the stock market. She never thinks about like any of this stuff. And on Friday night, usually I'm, I'm able to kind of uh, unplug and do the family thing. And then, you know, but I was like checking stuff on my computer when I got home for like Friday night after dinner. And my wife was trying to talk to me to tell me like, here's the plans for the soccer games this weekend and the basketball games. Cause we have to like, we have three kids that are busy on the weekends. And she has to like, tell me the, the schedule. Cause I don't know it. That's what she handles that stuff. And I handle the finances. Right. Yeah. And, when somebody says, what are you doing this weekend? I say, Robin will tell me on Saturday. Yeah. But, but she's like, you're not listening to me at all. What is going on? And I'm like, there's stuff going on in the financial world and I'm trying to catch up and pay attention. And she's like, well, what is, do I have to worry about this? And I'm like, not now. Just I'll explain later. And it is so, hard to okay, explain. So, so why do people care about a bank for, for uh, startups? All right, it's much bigger than that. We're about to explain. Silicon Valley Bank is not some fly-by-night company. It was. Did you realize it was as big as it is? Yeah, uh, I think so. I didn't. I mean, they said it was the 16th biggest bank in the, in the country. I wouldn't have known that list offhand. That seemed bigger to me than I would have assumed. So it was founded in 1983 to serve the tech world. And if you are a venture-backed company or a startup, there is basically a one in two chance you bank with Silicon Valley Bank. They are very familiar. They do lending. They do all sorts of things that some of the bigger banks just won't do with some of the smaller companies. So you all remember what happened during the pandemic. Um, there was uh, the, you know, the economy shut down and then it reopened and, and rates were at zero and boom, uh, bubble really quickly in asset prices uh, and certainly in venture capital funding. 
So uh, venture capital funding went from, call it $300 billion a year on average to like $700 billion in 2021. And the biggest beneficiary of that funding was Silicon Valley Bank. Now, the thing about a lot of these startups is they raised so much money, right? You talked about like the seeds at, at $70 million, the Series A at 400 or whatever it was. They raised so much money that sat at the bank that didn't necessarily need to be loaned to the depositors, right? Most banks make a lot of loans uh, or, or make some sort of loans to their customers. At Silicon Valley Bank, I don't know what percentage of the money sat in, in just in deposits, which in turn are invested. That is what a bank does. It borrows short. I'm sorry. It, it, it borrows short and it lends long, right? Borrows cash and lends. Right, so it earns the spread. So absent that, they were they were just uh, they were just investing the money in in treasuries and unfortunately in mortgage backed securities at a yield of one point six percent, you know, give or take. And so when rates rose, they had a mark to market loss on their balance sheet. What does mark to market mean? If they had to sell, they would have taken a big loss. If they were able to hold to maturity, hey, then they yeah, would. Duncan th- says, "Point the mic at your at your mouth, not the ceiling." If they were if they were able to hold to maturity, they would have been fine. Um, so that is like the long and the short of it. So on on last Tuesday, Silvergate, which was the biggest crypto bank, yeah, the, uh, the, the, that's that's an important point that you made about like them investing in treasuries and mortgage back. This wasn't like a subprime thing where they like made some really crazy off the wall bets. They they mismanaged their asset liability match, but they weren't taking insane risks. No, no, they were not like gambling. They they fucked up, no doubt, but it wasn't it wasn't I don't the other the I don't know crazy if, thing if, about them, if you look at their market cap chart, they were like a 10 to 12 billion dollar market cap company before the pandemic, and by November 2021, which is kind of when a lot of the tech stuff really peaked, they were at forty-four billion. So this thing wasn't trading like a bank either. This thing was trading like it was trading like a tech startup, a te- like like yes. liquid tech. So anyway, so why did this all unravel? What was what was the spark? Well, the spark was as such. They they lived by the sword and they died by the sword. In two thousand twenty-two and in, and into two thousand twenty-three, there is zero. There is not zero funding, but funding has dried up dramatically, and so. These monies that are that are just cash burning, the deposit, the, the deposits that came in are now bleeding the other way. So in order to shore up their balance sheet, they needed to they needed to sell securities. But in order to replenish their coffers, they needed to raise equity to keep it like in balance due to regulations. When they announced that they were doing that, people ran fast. And so there's 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 uh not speculation, there's there's gigantic VC funds. That sit at the top of the food chain that warned their investors to take the money out. And so that caused just a straight up run on the bank. On, on Tuesday, on Friday, $42 billion came out of the bank. And they were they were just insolvent. Like if, if everybody takes the money out of JP Morgan, guess what? Bank is insolvent. The, it was a straight up run the on the bank. The speed of it is just that's the most mind-blowing thing to me. And that's why this is so much different. This story's been going around. I was rereading The Panic of 1907 over the weekend, which shows how great my social plans were. But they, J.P. Morgan, the man, not the bank, told the tellers in 1907, count the money out more slowly to like stem the tide of a bank run. You can't do that now because guess what? People aren't actually getting $42 billion cash out. They're yeah. hitting a button and it's gone. And you're right. And I do wonder what the reverberations are going to be of the tech people that kind of abandoned their own partner here. I, well, I, it was in their best interest to do so, but in the same breath, that whole ecosystem is built a lot on trust too. And I don't know... I don't know. I think they, they shot themselves in the foot here. If they would have, I all, don't, if, if the biggest players would have said, everyone take it easy, calm down. Yes. We're, we're going to, and it is in their best self-interest. This is the, this is the, this is the ultimate prisoner's dilemma. So the, the question is, and really I don't blame anybody. Once, once the, once the month started, I think you would have been foolish to stay there. I really do. I, so I don't blame anybody once the cascade started, but the question is why did they take their money out anyway? Well, here's why FDIC insurance covers $250,000 worth of deposits. So some banks, uh, Schwab, for example, 80% of their depositors are covered because they have less than 250. At Silicon Valley Bank, as I mentioned, these are startups that raised a ton of money. So out of the, these numbers are directionally right, out of the $180 billion at the bank, some 165 of it was uninsured. So it was rational. Yeah, once Bloomberg this, has the number at 93% of the deposits were uninsured. Okay, so what does this do to banks going forward? I mean- 
is, do we just just do away with FDIC insurance and say depositors' money is good? Now, let's, before I mean, we get this, implicitly talk, talk. they are implicitly they kind of did. So it is. You, you remember in A Few Good Men when Tom Cruise has the rules and regulations book and he puts it on there and he tells Kevin Bacon, "Show me where," or not Kevin Bacon, who was I can't remember who was Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland, and he says, "Show me in the rules and regulations book handbook where it says to find the mess hall." And the guy says, I don't know where the mess hall is. He goes, it's not in the book. How do you know it? Right. That's the same thing with FDIC. Ins- They've basically said, like, it's in the rule book. It's 250. But I don't see how you can think it that if this happens now, the precedent has been set that they're ever going to let depositors lose money over 250. Now, let's so be what clear. that means, what that yeah. means is that I think a lot of people don't realize this. The way FDIC insurance works, the banks pay the money in. It's not like this isn't government bailout. We can get into the moral hazard stuff in a minute, but. The banks themselves put the money in. They pay an insurance premium. What, so what they should be doing now, the regulators should be saying, you're paying way more into this now. You put, Which you they put will. more in. They, they will. will. Unfortunately, that means probably lower yields for depositors than they were already getting. And then all the money goes into J.P. Morgan, Bank of America. Because my checking account was with J.P. Morgan. They don't pay me anything. I have to cash manage elsewhere if I'm going to earn money on cash. But I, I do not feel the slightest bit of worry about my money at J.P. Morgan going bad. Because if anything happens to them, they are getting bailed out. Right or wrong, they are going to be fine. Well, let's talk about let's talk about two things. What happens to banks going forward, and let's talk about the the the, the backstop, not the bailout. The, let's be clear: the equity went to zero, which is the way it should be. That's capitalism. Yeah. So to say that capitalism failed, no, this is capitalism. Literally, if you took risk in owning the the, the equity of the stock, that is a donut. That yeah, is this worth is, this absolute- is better than two thousand eight. The equity people were wiped out, bondholders were wiped out, the management depositors. Was- depositors, and this is not just rich tech pros, okay? These, there's 40,000 businesses. Um, the depositors should be made whole. What are, we, what are we even talking about here? Imagine the idea that you, before you open a bank account, you have to be a forensic accountant. That's, that's, that's insanity. So right. I'm not saying, I'm not, listen, I, I understand people's like pushback. I really do. Um, and the moral hazard stuff, we will unpack that and we will try and pr- put regulations in. It's not going to be perfect. We had no choice. Yeah, we had I'm no not, choice. I'm not a big fan. I wasn't a huge, I wasn't really into the whole argument about is this a bailout or is this not a bailout? Because guess what? The, it, it's in the system's be- best self-interest to fix problems like this when they happen so the whole system doesn't collapse and it's always going to happen. It just is. S- it just it's says, always going to happen. Systems, this is complex and systems are fragile. So they did what they had yes. to do. Like I said, had they not acted on Sunday, they would have acted on Monday because there would have been a run of the banks. And so why is why so going forward? Why is this so important? Um, the big the big banks are going to be probably the biggest beneficiary of this, unfortunately. And as I mentioned last night with Josh and Samir, um, regional banks are the lifeblood of the American economy. They loan to small businesses. You think J.P. Morgan is loaning to a small business in Albuquerque? Well, well, maybe. I, was, I don't know. It's a bad I example. But wonder, you know what I mean? I see these like local, and it's not even like regional, like Midwest. It's like local Michigan or West Michigan community banks go up all the time. And I always think to myself, who the hell uses these things? I, I always assumed they're for like, money businesses. laundering or something. I, I guess it must be local businesses. But I, I don't think it's like that in most other countries. I think most other countries don't have thousands and thousands of banks. They have a bunch of big ones that people go to. And you're right. That's, it is probably going to hurt small businesses and those regional banks. I don't – I mean there has to be consolidation, right? Now, let me I ask mean, you this. So to that point, okay, we know in, inertia is very, very powerful, especially at banks. People just don't move their bank account. It's a huge pain in the ass. So on the one hand, I thought, oh man, once confidence is gone, that's it. People are just going to consolidate at the big places. On the other hand, I think I'm leaning towards it's all good. Like for the most part. It, I think I'm leaning, be, I think right. I'm leaning it, towards whatever panic would have set in on Monday from literally just a – not just a trickle because there will be a trickle. Just a mass exodus. I think they stopped that. Yeah, you, you could be right where it could be like – do I really want to change all my account numbers for my utilities and for this bill and for that bill and my gym, met, all that stuff? Do I really want to change the numbers for that? Or am I going to roll the dice and just see what happens and things will probably work out fine? You, you could be right there. Um, where else do we, anybody we want to, I mean, I know we just went over all of this. Anybody? Okay, I, wanna, thought, I thought Matt Levine's on the psychology of a bank. Because I think, I yeah. think that the, the whole psychology of a bank run to me, so he said, um, Nobody on earth is more of a herd animal than Silicon Valley venture capitalists. And I thought that whole part of it, like the psychology behind what happened and why, it's, again, reading like the panic of 1907, there, there's no, 
there's no real reason for these things to set them off. And it, it's funny, like looking back, like as you said, like they were trying to raise money, and you would, and your initial thought with that would be like, okay, great, they're shoring up their capital base. But the no, other it was the Leslie no, no, no. Nielsen. It was yes. Leslie. Nothing to see here. <sighs> yeah, I. So I thought that just the whole psychology behind it, I thought was was. Oh, interesting that's a, that's that. a point. That's a point that we didn't really make. Is that I know we made this point, but just again to reiterate. The silicon, the 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 depositor base was so monolithic, right? Yes. It was not it was not a diversified customer base like say Bank of America. Yes, this is one of the reasons. I, it's kind of a maybe I'm making a stretch here for an analogy, but people kept wondering why isn't crypto acting as this macro hedge? And my thought process the whole time was because the people who own crypto are the same people who own startups and tech companies. They're getting crushed. And that's why crypto is getting crushed too. It's all the same thing. And that's that's the same thing you mentioned, that if you have all the same customer base, and there's no diversification in the client base, then they're all going to do the same thing because why would I not do what they're doing? It, we'll, talk you know, about, we'll, talk, we'll talk about crypto in a second, but just the speed at which this happened. Greg Becker, the CEO, was on stage last Tuesday talking about what he does in his free time. They tweeted, uh, I think on Wednesday, proud to be on Forbes' annual rank of best, America's best banks for the fifth straight year. And now there's going to be a whole political fallout, which uh, we don't necessarily need to get into today. But it's just it's just a really I, lousy, you know what, you know what the, lousy situation. What I, what I think one of the things we look back on this in, in I don't know how long, 5, 10, 15, maybe less, is how politicized the Fed's going to get. I think the Fed has done a pretty good job of staying out of that. I think in the future, they're going to be weaponized by Too one or yeah, both dude, of the it's parties. Here. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren is calling for Jay Powell's head. And the, the, but the crazy thing about the getting back to the Fed thing, there's a lot of people saying no, the Fed because we had inflation come in today. It was it was it's still falling. It's still high, it's still too high. A lot of people are saying the Fed has to be resolute in fighting inflation because if they don't, there's going to be a bigger financial crisis down the line. And my answer to my question, come back to that, is you mean like a bank run? There's going to be a bank run down the line like we just had. So they're in a really tough position of. Well, we have to still fight inflation, but if we keep pushing, what if something else breaks and then this, then the trust really goes and then we're screwed anyway? So we don't he, have, you can't a, worry about stuff down the line if stuff's breaking now. Here's a quote from Elizabeth Warren. Fed Chair Powell's actions to allow big banks like Silicon Valley Bank to boost their profits by loading up on risk directly contribute to these banks' failures. Come on. These were not – these are not sub – I mean, yes, were they were – they, uh, uh, Careless, or what's the right word that I'm looking for here? Um, is it negligence? Is it, is it bad management? Yeah, it's all those things. But th this idea that they were like gambling with depositors' money, come on, they were buying mortgage-backed bonds. Yeah, it was, a, it was dumb. Yes. It was dumb, but they uh, weren't buying seen, SPACs. And I've seen a lot of people trying to blame the fact that the Fed said they were going to keep rates low for a while, and that's the reason that they did this. That, again, there, there's other banks that handled this just fine. So, what do you think God, about, he, he, what do you think about the... There's a lot of people made the point that like this was the first kind of social media driven bank run. So how, how do you feel? Because I feel like we saw the very best and the very worst of Twitter over the weekend. There were some oh, great yeah. updates from people that were yeah. amazing. And then there was people who yeah. were hysterical. And yeah. I think we saw the the best and the worst of it. And depending on which one, which side you wanted to fall on, you could say you could point to pros and cons of social media in, in this age. I think, yeah. I was about to say, I think the cons outweigh the pros, but I don't know. I mean, all, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's complicated. I think it's the bottom line. Uh, yesterday, here's a paradox. Uh, yesterday on Sunday, on, I'm sorry, two days ago on Sunday, on Sunday morning. So here's, here's my statement. That's a paradox. I have such faith in, or I had such faith in the government doing the right thing that I bought cryptocurrencies. You, what, and honestly, when you told me that I was like, I didn't go that far. And you were right. You, you said this is finally the thing that sets crypto off as like the anti-system play. And it, it seems just from the price action, whatever, it's a few days. But it seems like that's the thought process. This is, this is not, I'm not doing a victory lap here. The, the thinking was twofold. One, and by the way, it's, I think it's probably a good thing that stock futures didn't trade all weekend. I was just looking at crypto to see like risk appetite. But the reason why I bought crypto is because first and foremost, I wanted like a high beta uh, risk on trade over the weekend because I thought I did think that the fed and the FDIC and the treasury knew the seriousness of what was going on. And I did think that they were going to do something about it. So that's number one. And they did. Number two was, I also thought rightly or wrongly that this, and it's, there's always a perceived bull case for crypto right from the, from the bulls. This would be a legitimate perceived bull case from crypto 
that's not completely completely like outlandish. It yes, it it kind it's starting to make more sense. It seems like every time you get one of these though, something else sets it back. So it's it'd be I, nice no, to I think agree. It, I, listen, I, I yeah. agree. I'm just saying the idea the idea of be, being able to do stuff outside the banking system, that idea uh, got a boost this weekend. It makes sense. My other, my general theory of life and financial crises is things generally work out most of the time. And that may sound like a very naive way to look at life, but I think it's the things that you worry about the most are rarely the things that end up hurting you. And it's the things you never think about at all that come and like wallop you. And like, so if you're, if you're not going to be able to predict them ahead of time anyway, what's the point of worrying? And I, I think that's kind of the way that I, I look at this. It, it, again, it may sound sort of naive, but I think that's the way I look at financial crises because there's a lot of people who think that it's been like easy in these past like 10 or 15 years to invest and this is the hard stuff. But think about, I, I was looking at my own, my own career and the crises in my career. So I was a sophomore in college when 9-11 happened. That was obviously a crazy thing. I come out of college for the first few years, great financial crisis, 2007, 2009. 2010, 2011, European debt crisis. Then we had the pandemic. Then we had the highest inflation in four decades. And now whatever this bank run thing is, it's kind of crazy because in some ways the market is completely different from like the early 20, early 20th century. And like things are so much better now and more, it, it, more structured and professionalized. But in other ways- And guess what? The things only are one very of these, similar. The only one of these on your list, Ben, that was remotely predictable was inflation. So yes, I made yeah. the point to you yesterday that we spent a lot of time during peacetime, for the most part, we spend a lot of time worrying about whatever they're putting on the headlines in the newspaper, whether it's the debt ceiling or, you know, pick pick your topic du jour. But the true, the, the true realization from this event is just a reminder that real risk, like th- things that you actually should be worried about, you never see them coming, just by definition. That's because right. that's what risk is. The other one thing I wanted to talk about was, this has been happening for a while now, but the technology industry is the new Wall Street. They're the new finance industry that people kind of hate on because of how successful they are. Like people hated the, one of the reasons, obviously the financial industry almost blew up the world. They weren't alone, but they almost blew up the world in 2008. And then the tech industry just unequivocally dominated the 2010s. Like they all became rich. They created these great companies. They created this great technology that helped us in in so many ways. And like, they really helped us get through the pandemic. But the other side of that is when you get that big and you're now the biggest sector in the S&P 500 and you're, uh, you know, you're worth millions or billions of dollars, there's going to be more scrutiny there and more hate. And I think the tech, it's interesting to watch the tech industry kind of sit back and play the victim card being like, whoa, why does everyone hate us now? And, and I think that territory comes with the success and maybe some of the ego that was in that, that sector for the past four to five years that I think people got a little too far over their, their skis there. So somebody texted me. One of the things that's going to come out um, over the next couple of weeks is the sales by insiders. The chief risk officer sold 75% of her stock and left the company a year ago. Well, a year ago is not, is not so bad. Um, that's pretty good market timing, actually. Greg Becker, the CEO, sold $3.57 million worth of stock, which is 12% of his total for over $2.2 million in profits just a week before the bank failed. That will probably get some scrutiny unless that was planned. Um, I don't know. Uh, the CFO sold uh, a lot. The, the CMO sold. Uh, I don't know if they can call that back, but don't you, this is one of those times but, where but, you can't really blame them because this happened so fast. Obviously, they, they, they were negligent in how they ran well, the bank, well, but they no, didn't no, know no, it was no, going to no. fail. Oh, yes, they did. You, don't you think, think they knew it was going to fail? They're going to bank run? They didn't know there was going to be a bank run. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to stand I, up for them, but I don't, I don't think they knew I it was going to happen this bad. I think that when they, when they prepared for that announcement, you don't think they had, you don't think in the back of their head, or maybe just, you don't think they had that conversation? What if there's a bank run? I mean, this, what if this freaks the depositors out? You don't think that crossed their mind? How could it not? How could it not? And another thing, bonuses, annual bonuses were paid on March 10th, which was, was that Friday? Now, to be very fair. <laughs> is that is that true? That that was 100% pre-planned. Okay. That was 100% pre-planned. That feels like a 2008 anecdote. Nevertheless, given that you were in the midst of a bank run, I don't know. I mean, that that's tough. Not a great look. True. Uh, let's talk about some market implications. Uh, so yields crashed 
the two year hit five percent like last Wednesday, and then on Monday it just yields crash. They fell a little bit at the end of last week, and then they went to briefly below four percent. Now they're this is the two year back again. up back up to four point three. I think the bond market is confused because we're we're trying to weigh a financial crisis, a run of the banks, a uh, potential of the Fed to maybe cut rates, and now wait, everything's okay now, and then we have inflation. I, so I think well, the bond market is just severely confused. Economic volatility is scary shit, right? We know what we're getting in the stock market. You don't want to see you don't want to see the Fed funds trading like a biotech stock, and that's really basically what's happening here. Jim Bianco had this this data point. There was a two-year change that had only happened, a two-year change in two-year yields that had only happened in 1987, 9-11, when Enron went down, I'm sorry, when Enron, whatever, and then after uh, after Lehman failed and after the TARP vote failed. And then on a three-day change, it was only 1987. So this is, the crisis might be contained, like they might have they might have plugged it, but this was a crisis, like make no mistake, even well, if it Corey was- Corey Hofstein says, this was yesterday, if the market closed now, the two-day move in the 10-year treasury futures Going back to 1982 would be 99.9 percentile. That's crazy. So we also had the, the – you've been looking at this a lot. Bespoke had this. The implied Fed funds rate was just basically crashed. So they went from projecting, uh, let's see, 50 – they're now they're, – the market – this was as of yesterday. So maybe it's changed because these things changed so quick. As of March 13th, the Fed funds rate, the futures were predicting a 50 basis point cut from current levels. And last no, week, no, 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 not for March, not for March. This is for a future meeting. July, yeah, July. But I'm yeah. saying, and then they were predicting a March 50 basis point raise. As that of was last like two week. weeks ago no, week. or three weeks yes. ago, we were like, "Oh, the economy's accelerating. Inflation is hot. They're going to have to do 50." What do you think they're going to do? I think this is the first meeting. This is the first meeting where we really don't know what they're going to do. 25 basis point raise, and then they then they're done. That's, I, my, that's what I think. I, I still think they're going to do 25. But is, um, is it weird to think that a banking crisis could be bullish for the stock market? Well, okay. I'm glad you mentioned that because stocks are up. It is Tuesday at 11 o'clock and stocks ha- stocks are like, I don't know how much higher they are off the lows yesterday. They're up 2% right now. Listen, you know, this is all short-term stuff. So we're speculating here. Don't hold yes. us to this. But um, people are panicking. And so they're pricing in rate cuts. And so that's bullish for the stock market. I mean, this is the type of shit that puts your brain into a pretzel, and this is why it's so hard. And then then you have other people going a step further and saying, okay, if the Fed does pause and inflation stays bad, then then down the line, they're going to have to raise again. So, And guess what? Guess what? Uh, The the inverted yield curve is uh, uninverting a little bit, maybe signaling that we are going into a recession. And then if if we do get consolidation at the banks, uh, credit – Supply will tighten up. It just will, and so will I think that a, cause a recession. Like, I think a lot of it, it just, depends there's so, on. There's, it's yeah. I think it depends on was the, is is this going? Where we look back on this in a few months and say that was just a blip and man that was crazy, but we we plugged the hole so fast. Could be. What's, what's the meme of the guy that slapped the thing on? Yeah. It, you know, could be. Guess what? This is a great reminder that nobody knows anything about the future. Some yeah. people are better at some people are better at guessing. And some people are more convincing, but we're all just guessing. Yeah. In, in the 2023 outlooks, no one said the biggest risk this year is a bank run. No one ever said that or, or said that that's the biggest catalyst for her being bullish. But it, my whole thinking is- Imagine if that. This is, imagine that a bank run is bullish for, for stocks because this will get the Fed to cut. I mean, it's just, but, it's what? If, but if this, if this banking crisis did have some legs, and I, I think a- Shaken trust in the financial system is deflationary as far as I'm concerned, but it really depends on how shaken that trust is. Is this just like a thing people are going to move on from and the next week get something else? Or is this going to really stick with some people? I don't people? know, I, man. We're going to be having congressional hearings about this. I think that there is a before and after SVB. I really do. I because think because be they're going to have to address yeah. the FDIC thing. And then are banks do, will banks become uninvestable because their, their margins just get squished to basically nothing? A lot of people are. Matthew Klein had a piece on this, and he basically said, maybe that should, maybe banks should be in the business of giving loans. And if the Fed's going to do this, maybe there should be like just Federal Reserve checking accounts for everyone that that are just implicitly backed to no end, or so it, you know that that that's pie in the sky maybe. But his whole thing was the bank's job shouldn't be to manage these assets and liabilities under a spread. It should be to to you know look at the the creditworthiness of their borrowers and give out loans. 
as opposed to trying to like manage interest rate risk. Can we say like things are pretty good and sometimes they get they go really bad and we don't need to like do a complete overhaul? Fair. Can we also say it, it, I want to do like a pros and cons of the tech industry. The tech industry is amazing at understanding that world of innovation and the finance world is probably not very good at it. But we can say that the tech industry is not very good at understanding the finance world. I think yeah. that that is I think we, we know that now, right? They are not very good at. And so the idea that they're going to come in and totally change the finance industry and disrupt it and everything's good. I don't think with this mentality, that's never going to happen. Right. It's going to be regulated as a change it, not the tech industry. Anyway, I just want to thank like the real professionals, like the people that are not to point Ben's point, the people that are not inciting sphere, but the people like Mark Rubenstein and Matt Levine and Matthew Klein and so many others that are like really like a, a voice of reason and common information. And uh, for that, for that, I'm grateful for the internet. The, the one other thought from Matthew Klein, that the piece that he's like, I'm sure. So as of the end of last year, Half of SVB's U.S. deposits, $82 billion, even paid any interest, meaning they had this money free and clear to do with anything that they would have earned on it. For putting, They could have put their money into 50 basis point T-bills back then, whenever it was at the time. Like they weren't paying anything to this, on this cash. To the, I, guess, I guess the point of you were saying, should, should you be a forensic accounting analyst if you have money to bank? No, but should you understand cash management? And we talked all the time. If you have your money at a savings account at a bank, you're making a huge mistake. You should have well, it. Well, I, do, I, do, I do think that banks are going to worry about treasury bills as competition. This will be a wake-up moment for them. And say, it should right, be. We got, we got to pay a little bit because people are going to start leaving. One more thing that I think is really important, Bob Elliott, who is great on Twitter, his, his handle is uh, Bob E. Unlimited. He wrote, feels like fall of 08 a little, but with much less panic. These regulators have had 15 years working on this. There is a lot more expertise and experience. The stakes are better known. All that is a likely positive for how this gets resolved, SVP depositors, and the system. So I, I just want to kudos. Did, did, did Powell uh, uh, probably do a bad job being too late to react and, too, and, and over-tightening? Yeah, like without a doubt. But Powell and Yellen and all of the powers that be who are probably working around the clock over the weekend deserve – all the credit in the world because had they not acted, I'm not, I'm not tr overstating things. I think it would have been chaos on Monday, but it could have been, you remember how the fed said, we feel like if we make a mess, we can clean it up. That's basically what's happening a little bit. They said, if we, they, they said that if, if something goes wrong, we have the ability to clean it up. And I think that's kind of what's happening. They, they made a mess and they're cleaning it up. Yeah. Um, anyway, what, a I will never forget the, this weekend, uh, just a wild, wild, uh, wild scene. Yes, but I, 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 for some reason, I was not nearly as worried as you. I wasn't plastered in front of my computer screen all weekend because I was out and about. We had soccer tournaments and stuff going on. Uh, it's funny to me, though, that, and again, maybe this is me being naive. I, I just feel like when something like this happens and it's, it's a systemic issue, the regulators and the central banks are going to step in and fix it. Dude, I'm with you. That's why that's why I, I bought risk assets on Sunday. I'm totally with you. But still, even if, even if you're mentally like, all right, there's an 80% chance they fix it, what if they didn't? Yes. But but that that's why, like, so the the implications from that panic of 1907 that I looked at, the stock market fell 50%. Industrial production crashed. The, in, the unemployment went up, like, from 2% or 2.5% to 8%. Like, it was one of the worst. If it wasn't for the Great Depression, we'd probably look back at that one as one of the worst... Uh, crises in history. For, that well, kind of got guess overshadowed what? by the Great Depression. Was that called the Great Depression, or am I thinking of something else? No, Before the, the Great Depression, is... no, no, no. Listen to me. Before the Great Depression in, of the '30s, I believe with the 1900s, the early 1900s, there was another period of time that was referred to as the Great Depression. Before no, the they Great called Depression. the only they didn't call them recessions was it back 1893? then. Eighteen ninety-three. It was panics or panics. depressions. Yeah, they were they're all called that. Panics and okay. so recession is a relatively new okay. term. But but that's the point of regulators these days. And again, I don't know what the unintended consequences of that are, but we've we've taken those periods off the table where we can let some crazy thing in the financial system like basically bring the whole system down. We've taken that off the table, which again, I don't know what the consequences of that are, but we have done that. And some maniacs think that's like not free market capitalism. Right. <laughs> right. Do you, do you want us to go back to the days? Like of let the risk takers be punished. Who the depositors? Regular <laughs> right. people? Right. Sorry. That that's that that's not the way that this is going to work. Never. 
Um, no. I also do wonder in terms of getting back to the market, like how offsides people are and how quickly might, we might see some sort of short covering rally or some sort of gamma squeeze or whatever the hell. Uh, put options volume hit a record on Friday, not surprisingly. So all that has to get unwound. So we can get, we can have a quick rally and a quick hurry. That made no sense, but. I mean, investing is, is seemed backwards for the past three or four years now, but I think especially in the short term, you have to look like three steps ahead to realize like the th- this this news headline versus what actually is being priced in by the market. And we could uh, be talking next week and the market could, something else could happen and the market could roll over and fall to bed and that wouldn't shock me either. Um, so we did get inflation this morning. Slightly hotter than expected, but really nothing, nothing with nothing, not like a major event. Uh, I think this will give Fed room to pause. I mean, to go down to 25. Really, or maybe pause. Uh, really amazing to me how quickly inflation got just shoved out of the way, right? <laughs> like it just like this, if, if not for the banking crisis, inflation got shoved been, in the locker. This would have been a huge day for like inflation yeah. being the thing. And now it's kind of like, eh, it came in about what we expected, maybe a little hot on this thing and a little less on this thing. And egg prices came down and eh, right. Inflation is what it is. No one cares anymore. I, and, and, I, uh, and it could if it comes in hot, but by yeah. the way, what, what would have happened? What would have happened today if inflation came in like, you know, significantly higher than expected if it was reaccelerating again, things would have got weird. Yes. Or uh, maybe the fed says that happened before we almost took out one of the biggest banks in the country. I don't, I would love to hear what their internal meetings are right now. Thinking, you think they're kind of looking around going like, I told you, you MFR. I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> right? there has, someone has to be saying that. There has to be someone saying, "Hey, Cash Car, I told you." Don't don't blame me. I dissented. <laughs> yeah, right. I, there has to be someone who's saying, "I told you guys this was going to happen," and no one listened to me. Well, you're yeah. the Federal Reserve Bank of Alaska. No one listens to you. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's see if a banking crisis can can do this. So when I was in Arizona, there was all these pool cabanas set up. Right, I'm sure this is going to be a big thing for spring break. I'm I didn't sorry. Realize this is- the, wor- the, the word Phoenician is a ridiculous word. Can we just say people from Phoenix? No, it's called a oh the Phoenician. Oh, you're right. Yes, I think it's not called a Phoenician resort. Oh, it is. My bad. I thought they were talking about a people, a set of people. My bad. Oh, okay, but but there's they had these all this place, and we looked at them like it's got a TV in it, and it's you can have your own waiter or waitress, whatever. And it's saying this is one in in Arizona that they rent for five hundred fifty to six hundred dollars a day, depending on the location. Uh, another one Jeez, in Miami how, how, is how much, for $1,200 a day. How much is a tequila? <laughs> hey, we'll get to that. <laughs> but but they say that like uh, the guests renting out these cabanas spend 35, per, 35 to 40% more on food and drink than other pool goers. And all the people who are renting these cabanas out are saying, it's crazy, we, we can't, we don't have enough to fill, like they're filling up every day and we don't have enough of them. Oh, can I say one thing on this while we're on this? I know we're gonna, we'll talk about the tequila later, but... Uh, I don't know what the comments were like in terms of like my comment that two hundred thousand dollars is not rich. Again, to reiterate, great income, and depending on where you are, it can be rich. But uh, but that's in my opinion, at least in New York, I live in New York. Two thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars is not rich. Surprise, I don't know, and, and and I don't even know like mathematically like what percentage of of New Yorkers make more than two hundred thousand dollars. But what do you? I mean, okay, let's ask this. In order to be rich, is that top one percent? Like, where are we drawing the line with rich? What does rich mean? You're in the top one percent. Or top five percent, top five or ten, don't you think? Okay, I think. Guess what? To be in the top five percent in New York, it's way, way, way over two hundred thousand dollars. I'm making. I'm going to guess it's like six hundred thousand dollars. I'm making that up. But anyway, anyway, uh, in Chicago, Josh and I the next day we had a lovely day. Uh, went for a walk. We went to the Field Museum, which was incredible. We tried to go to the Art Institute, but it was closed. By the way, I love Chicago. I love, love, love Chicago. It's, it's awesome New city. York, but one one hundredth of the population density. I was kind of bummed out the next day walking on Park Avenue. So many people. Um, but anyway, Josh and I went to Gibson's for lunch after that. And we got an incredible burger. One of the best burgers I've ever had. Guess how much it cost? This is a this is a top, top, top shelf steakhouse. Am I going high or low here? Uh I don't know. $30. 17. In New York, that's a $35 burger. So I'm sorry that I live in a, in a, uh, you know, a, a high and expensive place, but that, if you think I sound crazy, and I don't think, I think for the most part, people were, All right, were these, people with yeah, me? No, I, I think people were more, yeah, people were more thinking about the tequila okay. than anything else. Here, this is, these are old. This is from 2016. So it's a little old. 
Top 10% in New York is 210,000. Top 1% is 713,000. So okay. add some add something to that probably. So it's probably 250 now for top 10%. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, so if you're top 10%, that's a good that's a good that's a good income. Top 10% means you're earning a really nice income. I don't know where I draw the line at rich, but I think that's like top 3%. Anyhow, uh, where are we going next, Ben? All right. Uh... Man, this seems so old. I so I put, a chart in, I put a chart in here last week about, um, about the Grayscale uh, discount, which had gone the other way in a good way. So it was trading like a 48% discount. It shot up to, to negative 35, meaning the discount was getting less severe as investors anticipated maybe – that the the courts would rule in their favor to convert to an ETF. Again, this this seems like 14 years ago that I put this in the doc. So people really think that they might they might win their lawsuit. Yeah, oh, I don't I know. If, know I don't know what that means. I don't know. So I, I saw. I didn't read the whole article, but I saw somebody say that like, yes, they might win the ruling, but they still might not get the ETF. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on exactly. I assume that was dead on right. One more thing about getting back to the market thing. Not thinking. It is a lot of people are saying this is like the 1998 thing where the Russia Russia defaulted and we had the currency crisis in some of the Asian countries, and if if the Fed does back off, this is like a blow off top thing potentially. And I thought people, it was. I was I was saying that a week and a half ago before this happened. I, I said to Josh, "This is a blow off top in yields." No, I'm saying a blow, like could this be a blow off top in in like the markets where like. People take this a, a step further, and, and if the Fed step back, see, markets take off, and that I don't know. It's it's easy. How could you have a blow off? How could you have a blow off top in a bear market? Let's uh, one thing at a time. Okay, true. It's, because this is the everything bubble, people. All right, Wall Street Journal: the number of renter households making 150 grand or more rose by 87 percent between 2016 and 2021 to more than three million people. This is according to the U.S. Census Bureau. 44 million households rented median income for them was about 71,000, which is right around the median income for everyone. So that doesn't really tell you much. The whole point of this is article from the Wall Street Journal. And I think a lot of people assume that renting must be bad for your financial health. And there are stats that show like homeowners have higher net worth than people who rent. But I think that is kind of a correlation causation thing. And I, I just think they interviewed a few people in here who want to buy and say they kind of can't because they're out, they're not, they're priced out of the market, like a place like Austin, for example. But I, I don't think you have to be a homeowner to, to have a high net worth and to become wealthy. I, I think renting is just fine for people who maybe live in a big city or want to have flexibility or want to move around a little bit. And I think there is this stigma attached that renting must be a bad thing. And you're paying your landlord to, you're paying your landlord's mortgage and that kind of thing. And like owning a home is not for everyone, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, well, I think that renting gives you a lot of freedom. It allows you to move. Guess what? Guess what? If you locked in a mortgage at 3%, which is a beautiful thing, you're stuck. We're trapped, yes. You and I are trapped in our 3% mortgages for a long time. So I'm very- My I'm kids very... asked me, my kids asked me the other week, are we ever going to move out of this house? And I said, not unless mortgages reach our 3% again. We're stuck. We're staying here till you're in high school, probably. I'm I'm thrilled with my house. I'm very very happy with my house. Uh, Robin sent me a house the other day, and she's like, "This is actually a pretty good price." I said, "Not when mortgage rates are six and a half percent." True, but how many mudrooms does that house have? <laughs> it was a big house. <laughs> someone someone in the comments last week did say, um, "If Michael stays in his house for thirty years, because we were talking about people staying in their houses longer, he's just gonna have twelve mudrooms by the time it's all done." <laughs> And that was pretty good. All right. Uh, this is one more about, we ta I've been talking about this for a while. If you want to buy, I think now you should probably build if you can. Kevin Oakley tweeted this, traffic to home builder websites hit an all-time high on March 7th, even way beyond the any time during 2020 to 2022. I really think that this is the way to go if you want to have any sort of leverage or negotiating power and maybe get rates a little lower. Is to, I'd, be going, I'd be going to a lot of home builders right now and seeing what they have for land or inventory or whatever, if, if I'm in the market right now. that That's where I'm negotiating. All right, let's do our survey of the week. What would you do if the bill came and you were charged $86 for a drink? We put this on our YouTube channel. Ask to speak to the manager was the highest at 46%. The next one was pay it and stew in silent rage at 23%. That was me. Some people said they'd leave a Yelp review. Some people would complain to the server. Some people would ask to speak to the owner. Wait, so, what do you mean some? Put, what do you mean some? Hello? What? Is that a joke? This is horrible no, podcasting. You just, you, just, you just said some would do this, some would do that, some would do that. Are we going to give numbers? 
So I said 46% would speak to the manager and 23% would, that's the majority. And then the rest of them are 5% so the ma- speak to the owner. Yeah. The, ma- the majority, 46% would speak to the manager. 5% would have to speak to the owner. By the way, I will, I have to do a attraction to use a, a Sal Guvernalism. Uh, the Hoxton bar and the Hoxton hotel are, I think are, I believe are separate entities. So the Hoxton Hotel is a lovely place with lovely people, great amenities. I will be going back. The Hoxton Bar, I will never frequent again, ever. Because to reiterate, the guy was a dick. <laughs> like it wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that it was egregious. He was an he was really a jerk about it. And I think I said this last week, but he's oh, like it was, it was one guy, it's not the whole place. But here's the thing, they I did said the make it. We have we have people in here spending seven hundred dollars all day, every day. I'm like, what what is that? What what? What does that mean? Go ahead, Ben. What they, are you about to say? They did also make it right, and they gave us a free round of drinks the next night. Well, the next night, we – what did we have? Duck, duck, goat? Is that where we went to dinner? What a great place that was. So we went to a bar after, and I, I said – I said, Joe, do you have Class A's only? They said, yeah, yeah, we do. I said, how much That's is right. it? You were pricing it at every restaurant we went to. <laughs> $30. Now, I understand there's a premium for a, a hotel bar. 86 I rest my case. Uh, yeah. We got a lot – go ahead. Anything else? No, it was just funny to me. Every bar we went to, you were pricing it out and, and asking, you're like creating a little- I mean, Class A Azul is delicious. It's my favorite tequila, but you know, it's just not their fault. It's, it's uh... anyway, we got a lot of emails last week, Ben. What were you talking about with uh, Mark, with, uh... oh, you're talking about David Einhorn's haircut. And yeah. we got like- A lot of people, a lot of people, I don't want to, I don't want to like <laughs> hair shame here, uh, but he was, a lot of people said it's a piece. It could be like a, a, uh, a hair piece. Or I respect plugs. that. Uh, a lot of people emailed us. I would love Mark to see you with a hair piece. Me too. I think it would be hilarious. Just don't say anything and just show up one day with one. <laughs> I could. I would. I would just die. I would just die. Burst out laughing. Uh, so Mark Davis has, does have the worst haircut of all time. By the yes. way, any thoughts on the Jimmy G signing? I I, I, I didn't come prepared. Okay. for Raiders talk today. Uh, youth sports. What's this about? Oh, it's no. I I had I had a whole spiel on youth sports, but I can save it. Okay, we'll do it next time. I'm just. All right, I'll start with recommendations. Okay. Last night, uh, I threw on, this is just added on HBO, one of my favorite comedies of all time. I love you, man. I love that movie. Andy Samberg and, and is it J.K. Simmons? Is that his name? Yeah, the dad. Uh, with the Hank Mark Dukas stuff, it's just... <laughs> uh Paul right, Rudd is great in that movie. So that you know when that movie came out? A while ago, right? March twentieth, two thousand nine. Jeez, yeah, we don't get good, good comedies anymore. That's for sure. I'm so sad. I mean, I we don't we don't get them anymore. They just don't happen. <sighs> yeah, I know. And Paul Rudd's doing Marvel movies now. I said to Robin uh, on Friday, "I'm going to the movies tonight." Logan goes, "What are you saying?" Logan's a three year old. And I said, uh, either Creed 3 or Scream 6. I just <laughs> <laughs> saying that out loud. What is happening? That's what that's those are the Creed 3 or Scream 6. So it's either uh the sixth movie in a franchise that started 35 years ago, or the third film in a reboot from 45 years ago. 50 years ago. That almost sounds like a bad joke. Yeah. Right? I'm going I'm going to you basically said I'm going to see Rocky 9. Yeah, seriously. Um, but anyhow, guess what? Scream 6, uh, it was fun. I had a good time. And thoroughly okay. entertained. No complaints. And guess what? Right. Theater was packed. We're back. They figured out. Wasn't it like the biggest one of all those Scream movies as well? In terms of box office? Yeah. Did I see that or oh, was really? I wrong? Um, what did you... Uh, I blame oh, what did you? Did you watch the... Uh, did you watch The Last of Us finale? Yeah. I was a little underwhelmed. I'm not going to lie. Me too. I, I was I, I waiting that, for thought... like a big something to happen and it was kind of, it was good. It was good. But I thought the show admittedly trailed off a little for as much as I loved it at the beginning. I thought it was just good at the end. Yeah. I, I, I was looking for great. Happen. I wanted something to happen that didn't happen. But listen, I, it, I mean, it's a, it's a very good show. No complaints. It's, it's good. I, but it was like, I was waiting to be blown away by an ending and it didn't What do we happen. have coming back? Succession is coming back. What else? I think there's one other show that we watch. Yellow Jackets, back. I like. Yeah, I there's a lot that. of TV coming. Right. All right. So I, I mentioned this a few times. If you haven't read this and you're a student of financial history, Panic of 1907 is a great book. You know who has the forward in that one? 
in the Oh uh, wait. Uh, oh, I do. Um uh is it for Galbraith? the paperback. W- William oh, Bernstein Galbraith... for the Oh, did Galbraith write the book? No, it's uh Robert Bruner and Sean Carr, which I don't know where they're but it's a great book and it's uh, definitely worth your time cuz I love read I think reading on financial crises is is to understand the markets is really and, helpful. And, and, am I right? Is that a short, shortish book? Or am I thinking of the mm. 1932 one? The Galbraith Yeah, one it's only like 200 pages. It's only like 200 pages. Okay. It's not bad. Uh, uh, other one. I read on my flight to and from Chicago. I finished the book on the flight. I, I did some skimming because I, I, I pass over, like, this is going to sound pretentious, but books that have, like, wisdom about them, like, here's the takeaway, here's what you need to do, I usually skip that stuff because I feel like it's kind of similar in most books. What do you mean? Books. What do you mean? Just like I would rather get to the meat of it in the data in the stories and then skip over like here's what you should do about this mm. because I feel like a lot of it is kind of been there done that anyway. Seen What's it the before. good like, life? What is a good life? The good life is the story of the longest scientific study of happiness. They started for Harvard. They started following these people in 1938, I think, and it was like 700 people. A lot of these people had just got back from war, and they followed them through their whole life, and they did a study on what makes people happy. And it, they followed these people. They had. They had quarterly interviews or yearly interviews, and they had surveys, and they did medical tests. It was like an extensive study on these people. They followed them from like their teenage years to when they died, and these people checked in all the time. And the stories on the people for this study were amazing. It was like the this is a lawyer who made a ton of money, and then this is a teacher who didn't make much money, and the teacher was way happier because he had better relationships, and the lawyer had no friends. And the whole point of the book was – what I, I I'm a huge fan of these happiness things. I can't get enough of it, just because I think it's it's really interesting. But the whole point of the book was the biggest thing to make you happier is having good relationships in your life. Yeah. That was the that was the one takeaway. And it's but the stories of these people, of like these people from World War II and the stuff they went through, and them having kids and getting married and getting divorced and all this stuff. It it's a really interesting case study and what makes people tick and what makes people happy. Very good book. Highly recommend. I also like happiness. Okay. All right, next week. Are there more dominoes wait, wait, to wait, fall? Wait, 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 wait. Let's just rewind. For just if case anybody missed it, we had a great episode on Monday. Oh, yes, we did. We talked to Dr. David Kelly from J.P. Morgan on Friday, right after Silicon Valley Bank went under. That guy was very impressive. Great. Yeah, check out our Talk Your Book for Monday. He was, he was very good. He, he had a lot of really good stats, too. His one stat that really stood out to me was he said we've had 23 months in a row – where wage growth has been lower than inflation. Meaning this is not like a wage price spiral from the 1970s. This is something else. And he was also saying at the time, the Fed kind of messed up, which confirmation bias or not, I, I, I agreed with him. So next week, more dominoes to fall or is like, are things back to normal? Um, what's the higher, what's the higher, prob- if you had to make a probability bet? You know what? I'm just going to punt. I'm All just right. gonna punt. It yes. It, 51 49 things are back to normal. It's aggressive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Send us an email, animalspiritspod at gmail.com, and we will see you next time.